Hello and welcome to Stupid Ancient History with Midgley and Taylor and our resident expert, non-expert and special guest James the Science Toolboy. Hello. As always we're wearing togas, our kylixes are full and we're going to look at the birth of Cyrus the Great. So we're talking about his birth. Uh, as a scientist I'm guessing it's not that elaborate, it doesn't change much birth. True. And as the only woman within this little <laughs> flower, I can say that yes, it hasn't really changed a lot. However, I don't think he was born in a birthing pool. But there you go. But yes, yeah, the process isn't that different. There is a bit of a tradition in the ancient world about giving kind of hero characters and great men a bit of a special birth. So it's kind of marking them out right from the very beginning that they're going to do something amazing and they're kind of higher and a little bit more they're better elevated. than you yeah, well I, I mean to be fair else. i've never been called the great so <laughs> my husband tells me that all the time so <laughs> if we're thinking about examples we've got romulus in rome we've got even like alexander the great as well so yeah this isn't that unusual when we're looking at ancient history yeah. okay was, so when, when you say elaborate you mean weird are there wolves <laughs> no 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 it's it's not quite mythology. It's not kind. Of, it's not horny Zeus coming down and sleeping <laughs> with anything that moves or doesn't. Um, but there are things like prophecies, omens, destiny, and whatnot. And this idea of he's meant to do something great because he has this crazy birth story. I would be belligerent and do nothing in my life if someone <laughs> told me that. You're like, no, the birth was <laughs> enough. You put me through enough already. I'm just gonna go home. Yeah. Now, the origins of the first Persian king doesn't actually start in Persia. It starts in Media, which is just next to Persia, with the king Astyages. So we're going to look at a reading. We're going to look at Herodotus um, 1.107. So this is what it says. It says, Astyages had a daughter called Mandane, and he dreamed one night that she urinated in such enormous quantities that it filled his city and swamped the whole of Asia. He told his dream to the Magi, whose business it was to interpret such things, and was much alarmed by what they said it meant. I, I mean, I'd be alarmed if it was literal. <laughs> like, what metaphorical, like... Also the fact that it's someone's job to work out what this means. So she, she, she had a dream, she weed so much it flooded all of Asia. She Absolutely. Clearly had to, she clearly had too much to drink, didn't she, before she went to bed. That's, I mean, a, that's a lot. That is a lot. <laughs> so we're not told exactly what this seer says, but clearly Astyages is not happy. Um, so when Mandani is old enough, he marries her off to a Persian prince, Cambyses I. Basically, she and the bad omens are someone else's problem now. And oh, they've okay. got to deal with the weeing over so all you, of the Yeah, you can go flood their kingdom with... Pretty much, middle. yeah. <laughs> go and pee in, their, go Did, pee in the Persians. Was tent. it normal for them to seek someone to interpret these dreams? Because I have weird dreams and I just don't mention them. Oh yeah, if you were yeah. a king, your dreams were really important and you'd have a whole tier of people trying to tell you what it meant. I'd have no friends if I told <laughs> everyone the weird things I, I dream. Yeah. Also, I can never remember my dreams either, which is probably a good thing, but... Yeah. However, even though he's married off his daughter with this fictional bladder problems off to another <laughs> state, <laughs> his dreams don't get any better. Herodotus! So, this is what Herodotus says. So, he says, before Mandane and Cambyses had been married a year, Astyages had another dream. This time it was that a vine grew from his daughter's private parts and spread over Asia. As before, he told the interpreters about this dream and then sent for his daughter, who was now pregnant. James looks bemused. <laughs> <laughs> Just a lot. I mean, every all of his dreams seem to involve something about his daughter's crotch. I'm a little bit worried about this. <laughs> also, I mean, that is the mother of all periods, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> <Just a line. laughs> oh. Oh, Taylor. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. So, yeah, he has another dream. Um, do you care to be the Magi and work out what it means? Uh, I'm assuming she's going to give the person she gives birth to is going to conquer Asia or something like that. Are, are, are vines like, prominent in their culture? Is we prominent in their culture? <laughs> Apparently do so. Do these signs actually mean anything? Well. We don't know if they're very prominent, but I mean, everyone wheeze, so yeah. Um, but it's not subtle at all. But if we're thinking about what they said, 
to him about what he meant the people that are advising him and himself they also kind of all think the same which is that it's a sign that her child is going to take over the whole of Asia and basically take the throne away from Astyages. Is that not something he would want for his grandson? Well, it's more of a usurping, like, he's ah, not going to okay. die of old age, he's right. either going to get peed on to death <laughs> or strangled by vines. And also, it's not necessarily take control, it's this idea that it, it might be that they're going to destroy all of Asia. Ah, yes, okay. so choked with vines, drowned in we. It's not looking good. So not a nice way to die, is yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> so either way, Astyages calls for his daughter to come to him in her heavily pregnant state. And when Mandani comes to him, um, he has her put under close watch. And he also calls for one of his loyal subjects, one of his courtiers, a guy called Harpagus, and gives him some pretty straight-to-the-point instructions. Herodotus! So he says, get hold of Mandane's child, take it home and kill it. Then bury it how you please. Lovely. Granddad of the year there. <laughs> I know. Your, and father. I mean, he's doing over everyone in this. <laughs> Makes Boris Johnson look like a good dad, doesn't he? Careful, that could be libelous. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on swiftly to avoid further court action. When Cyrus is born, Harpagus takes the child and runs away. He just likes it. Why not? Yeah. Who's going to stop him? The king? No. Yeah. So so he legs it intending to kill him or to save him or? Well, that's what we're going to find Okay. Out. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you know, someone should have done a really bad Tommy Cooper impression then, shouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it was really bad. Yeah. I'm, so, I'm really sorry. <laughs> so anyway, he takes it dressed in grave clothes. Basically means like poor looking. Oh, okay. It's funerary it? clothes, oh, isn't it? Oh, funerary clothes. Right, there you go. Um, so, no, yeah, sorted. To his house, weeping all the way, apparently. So this is a nice person. We like her. I mean, he's still seemingly on board with the idea. <laughs> well, when he gets home, he tells his wife everything. He doesn't want to kill the child, as he is sort of a relative. We'll come to that in a bit. Okay. Um, but also fears what Astyages will do. When it says fears what Astyages will do, probably to him, if Astyages finds out that the kid is not dead. He's not a guy to be messed with. I don't know if you've picked up on that yet. A little bit. I mean, <laughs> yeah. if, if he's treating his daughter this way, someone who's, what did you say, he's kind, kind of related. Mm. He's sort of a cousin sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's a goddamn. Yeah. But also, he's also frightened about what Mandane would do if she becomes the next queen. Oh, okay. She becomes the queen and finds out that he's you, the one who's... Stole it. Did she not, what do you mean finds out? Did she not notice when he was taking it off? Apparently of not. Okay. <laughs> So what did Harpagus do then? So he decides that someone else has to do it for him. So, so he, he, can't, just... he can't bring himself to kill the kid, basically. But he's willing to let someone else kill it for him. Yeah. What a hero. <laughs> so he calls for the king's chief herdsman, which is a man called Mitridates. Mitridates comes rushing over and Harpagus tells him the following. So we're going to look at Herodotus again. So this is what Herodotus says. Um, the king's orders are that you must expose this infant in the wildest spot you know of amongst the hills, where it may soonest die. I am to tell you, moreover, that if you disobey and find some means of saving the child, the king will have you put to death in a way not pleasant to think of. <laughs> not there you go. <laughs> so basically, you're screwed if you don't do as I tell you, because I'm too much of a wimp to do it myself. Yeah, he's just lying to him to get him to do his own dirty yeah, work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he, he's passing the book, and I do like that. A, a manner that will be unpleasant to think <laughs> of. Not like, oh, I really fancied, you know, just being burned alive. It's something unpleasant to think of. I know, I would have thought with a threat, like, specifics would be important. Not just, no, something nasty would happen. <laughs> Bad things will happen oh. to you. Either way, poor old Mitridates, who's effectively a slave, if nothing else. Um, try not to think about this unpleasant thing that will happen to him. Mitridates obediently runs off home with said child. Did you get like past the parcel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. So this herdsman bloke's now legged it with a baby. Yep. Is that all there is to it? <laughs> James. No, not quite. <laughs> 
So Mitridates runs off to his shack with the baby, but also to check on his wife, Sino, which in Greek means bitch. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, bi bitch is in like a literal female dog or in like the derogatory... We're not sure. We're not sure. Okay. You're splitting hairs either way. <laughs> why, why would someone name their daughter that? Why would you dream about your daughter peeing all over Asia? Touché. So, the thing is that Sino is also heavily pregnant. Ah, okay. Okay. So when he gets there, he tells her the whole story that Harpagus has given him Mandani's child to kill and that he would send men to check on whether he'd done it or not and there would be <laughs> an unspecified terrible death. Um, and his wife, who seems to have not noticed, that he seems to have not noticed she's already given birth, bursts into tears and tells him the following. Herodotus! So my own child, she said, was born today and it was born dead. Take the body and expose it and let us bring up Mandane's son as our own. If we do this, no one will find out that you have disobeyed your masters. Moreover, we shall have managed pretty well for ourselves too. Our dead baby will have a royal burial and this live one will not be killed. Okay, so, so a bit of a bait and switch. It's the good old switcheroo with the living dead baby. Slightly disgusting, but yeah. Yeah. She's very composed to say but that her baby's just just, uh, just, just given birth. Just died, yeah. So she's just given birth in a shack. Baby's I mean, this, dead. This her baby. husband comes in <laughs> with a so with another, another baby. <laughs> what the hell's that under your arm? Oh, it's just another baby. Like I say, this vague threat that he was given clearly had an impact. So he didn't notice his wife had given birth. <laughs> no one seems to notice anything about the women in this story, do they? Apart from that, they're all having weird dreams about him. No one seems to really notice much else about him at all. Oh, just well, I'm just going to borrow this kid and run off with it. Yeah. See you later. Yeah. Women and children are screwed. Clearly, no one cares about them. So Mitridates takes his child to the hills to be chewed on by wild beasts. Again, it's not it's not really very good parenting, is it? But I'm it's gonna look legit. It's gonna look legit, but I mean, God, come I on. I mean, if it's not, bad things will happen. <laughs> yeah, a terrible unspecified <laughs> death. Yeah. So the uh, the wild animals are thinking, hmm, tea. <laughs> then he returns the body to Harpagus after a few days, who duly gave the child a royal burial. Mitridates and his wife raised the child of Bandane, Cyrus, as their own. Okay. So they've called it Cyrus. They call it Cyrus. And everything is hunky dory. No one gets a whiff of this until young Cyrus is about 10. And um, him and some other boys are playing this game they called Game of Kings. Basically, the kids all get together, they appoint someone to be king. He then appoints like his chancellor and people to dig ditches and. It's, this, this sounds like a very boring game. Well, you know, it can be, yeah. Um, so they're, they're playing this game of kings, um, and ultimately, as they're playing this, the son of a noble who's also playing with like the scrappy kids that Cyrus is now, um, he orders this rich kid to do something. Rich kid refuses, um, and in line with the game of kings, Cyrus has this kid punished by the other kids um so obviously rich kid runs home to his dad and they're clearly not happy uh so they demand that the young cyrus is dragged before the king dragged before astyages okay because you know the king's got nothing better to I'm do i'm about than... to say uh, is he not got he's not a bit busy to like mediate children's spats well no he's done away with all his problems aren't he they're all off in persia or so he thinks fair enough so Young Cyrus is brought before the king, Astyages, his own granddad, because he's played this game and punished this son of a nobleman. Of course. Now, do remember that at this point, Astyages doesn't know who this random kid who's brought before him is. And Herodotus now gives a suspiciously detailed account of what happens <laughs> next. So... Says Astyages, fixing his eyes upon Cyrus, said, Had you, the son of a slave, the impudence to handle in this outrageous manner a boy whose father is my most distinguished subject? Master, Cyrus replied, there was nothing wrong in what I did to him. We boys in the village, and he was with us, were playing our game, and they made me king, because they thought I was the best man to hold the office. The others obeyed my orders, but he did not. 
He took no notice of me until he was punished. That is what happened, and if I deserve to suffer for it, I am ready. I'm going to guess that saying I was the best man for the job to someone who's already a bit of a nutter king isn't a great idea. Well, you think, but I mean, at this point, the penny drops for SDAGs. Um, the boy in front of him is the right age. He goes on about how this answer is not the answer of slaves and proves he's clearly more noble than everyone. And he's also spotted that young Cyrus is starting to look a little bit like him. He sees okay. some of the family resemblance. So, wanting to find out a little bit more about what's going on, he has to be left alone with Mithridates. So, he then asks Mithridates, Mithridates how this child came into his possession. So, at first, Mithridates tells him the child is his own. So, he's still worrying about the unpleasant death. So now, <laughs> ten years have passed, but it's still, it's there really his mind. still weighing on his mind. But when threatened with torture, he tells the truth. So if you threaten this guy, he'll do basically anything for you. Again, and obviously <laughs> this again shows that he, along with it seems like most other men within the Persian Empire, <laughs> was a pretty poor dad. Because you can imagine, well if I'm going to be for the chop, what's he going to do with this broglet? But he's clearly not thinking about that, is he, at that particular moment he's, in time. He's worrying about that unspecified I hope, bit. what was her name, Sino, I hope she's twigged this, like, do the hoovering or I'll kill you! <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, that's the same method that I use in my house, James. Works very well. So, rather than killing the young boy there and then, um, Astyages consults the Magi, his priests, who suggests his dream or prophecy has been fulfilled. So these are the same blokes who told him this horrible things are going to happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and now they're like, told you, he's back! <laughs> but it's fine, because, you know... Because been dealt with. Yeah. Right, okay. So, happy with this, young Cyrus is sent back to the palace of Cambyses and Mandane to take his rightful place. So he just, this ten-year-old turns up, Mum! Dad! I'm, <laughs> I'm back! I'm the heir to the Persian throne. Do they have any other kids at this point, or is it just him? We don't know. Okay. Herodotus doesn't, he's not big on details like that. Why would he be? I mean, essential details, like, you know, <laughs> whose dad is a ghost. <laughs> hours of entire pages gold digging ants gold but. digging ants absolutely but whether they were the siblings not important um so cyrus has been sent off back to persia nastyages also summons harpagus and asks him what's gone on yeah as you would and harpagus confesses that yet yeah, he couldn't kill the kid but instead he sent his most trusted eunuch to it's a, there's a hierarchy of eunuchs. Oh, of course there is. He sent basically his most trusted eunuch or assistant to check that Mitridates had done what had to be done. So he thinks Astyages is happy. Astyages then tells Harpagus what Mitridates has told him. It tells him that the child is alive. But, you know, it's cool because, you know, the whole dream thing. So they are all square. Yeah, it's turned out all right. No. No, it hasn't. No, <laughs> so, before Harpagus leaves the palace, though, Astyages says... And now, he said, since things have taken this lucky turn, I want you to send your own son to visit the young newcomer and come to dinner with me, my, with me yourself, as I intend to celebrate my grandson's deliverance. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on, Herodotus. When Harpagus' son arrived at the palace, Astyages had him butchered, cut up into joints and cooked, roasting some, boiling the rest and having the whole properly prepared for the table. Dinner time came and the guests assembled with Harpagus amongst them. Dishes of mutton were placed in front of Astyages and everybody else except Harpagus. Oh, so fed him his own son. <laughs> you can see where this is going, can't you? Herodotus. <laughs> When Harpagus thought he'd eaten as much as he wanted, Astyages asked him if he had enjoyed his dinner. He answered that he had enjoyed it very much indeed, whereupon those whose business it was to do so brought in the boy's head, hands and feet. Those bits obviously weren't they, they were they were worth cooking. Yeah, no, they weren't good. In the covered dish, stood by Harpagus' his chair and told him to lift the lid and take what he fancied. So Sorry, so they didn't even just feed him his son, they gave him his fill of his son. They tricked him into eating his own son. Yeah. 
Carry on, Herodotus. So Harpagus removed the cover and saw the fragments of his son's body as he kept control of himself and did not lose his head. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. To the, to the phrase. At the dreadful sight, Astyages asked him if he knew what animal it was whose flesh he had eaten. I know, my lord, was Harpagus's reply, and for my part may the king's will be done. He said no other word, but took up what remained of the flesh and went home, intending, I suppose, to bury all of it together. And that was how Harpagus was punished. He kept it together. <laughs> Fair play to him. Yeah. It's not it, ended well for Harpagus. It hasn't done, but I'd like to say, I imagine if you presented any parent with their child, or you know, the head of their child and said he was eating them, he, he kept his composure. Yeah, just kind of like, Thanks for dinner, I'm going to take this. <laughs> I mean, the worst can I have this in a doggy bag, please? Oh. The worst that I've heard, my father-in-law obviously didn't feed anyone children. I just like to put this point out there now. Where's but, the story um, going? He put, he, uh, my husband uh, had two sisters and they had pet rabbits. And they weren't looking after the uh, pet rabbits particularly well. So, um, yeah, my father-in-law decided to cook the rabbits, put them in a pie and then fed the pie to the two uh, girls, and after they'd eaten it, he told them that the pie contained... Um, oh my <laughs> God! <laughs> did, did, he have, did he have dreams of <laughs> we, waves of we going over East Manchester or something? I don't know. I, I think that he was taking his army training a bit too far, that's all I'm going to say. That, I, we've never been to my father-in-law's house for tea, and you can see why, can't you? Yeah. But anyway, back <laughs> to Astyages. <laughs> After feeding Harpagus his own son, then Astyages decides he's going to meet Cyrus, explains the whole thing, what's just happened, and tells him, it's all right, we're good, off you go, back to Persia. Fair enough. So then with this whole birth story of Cyrus the Great, it obviously brings up a few issues to do with just how reliable Herodotus is. Mm. Um, even though he's claiming these are all uh, actual accounts he's heard, we've got this obvious issue with, is this factual or is it folklore? Um, a lot of it, like the eating of the sun, is probably more folklore than I don't know, practice. It's unless probably based on something, isn't it? And then it's just kind of got changed throughout yeah. history and it's got altered. And... and obviously things like the bits where... Herodotus accounts verbatim speeches, like the speech Cyrus gave to Asiages, that's almost certainly just elaborated on and yeah. made up. The story was probably he gave a great speech and Herodotus so, just thought, I can't write that. Got to is, write it, is this kind of what you're saying with this is the problem with this is that there's no one else writing about this, it's only yeah. him we've got. There's no one else writing about it. Also the dates are an issue, so we're talking Herodotus is writing in the mid 400s. This is all happening around about 600 BC. Right, okay. It's not like there's tons of records knocking about no. or official accounts of, and on this day, Astyages did this. So he's got problems with that. And he's Herodotus, to be fair to him, um, is doing the best with the material he's got. If the only source you've got is some goat herder on a mountain telling you a story, you go with the goat herder. Mm. Um, but either way, I mean, the whole thing positions Cyrus as the founder of this great dynasty, which is probably why he's had this extra birth story, this crazy story about his birth put in there, because he's meant to be this great founder, so everyone needs a cool origin story. You can't, just, you can't just have them be born, grow up. No, you can't just be take, take over the, the kingdom. Or no, anywhere. it's like any good X-Man. They need an <laughs> origin story. It's probably based, isn't it, on... It's based on propaganda that would have been put out by the kings of Persia at the time oh, yeah, yeah. and then obviously it's just kind of got tweaked and it's got altered and things have got lost and so they might well have said you know that if you do this then this is what I'll do to you I'll eat your children or I'll make you eat your own children but, it's a terrible threat but it yeah the, the chances of that actually happening are probably pretty slim is, is there any chance that like there's mistranslations? It wasn't like I'll eat, your, I'll eat your cat, but I know mistranslations. <laughs> I'll eat your giant ants. Yeah, yeah. possibly. It, it is. It but could well be that. The other thing as well, this idea of the abandoned child coming back to be great—it's not uncommon. 
not just in the ancient world. So you've got obviously Romulus and Remus were abandoned at birth. You've got Moses whacked in the basket yeah. and sent down the Nile. Yeah. Cyrus is chucked on the side of a hill. Even fairy tales and most Disney movies yeah. have the idea of trying to find their long lost. Yeah. Parents who abandoned them. Sad, sadly, my nieces have made me very familiar with Tangled, and that's what happens in that. Yeah, and it's this idea, isn't it, that if you're born with everything against you, it makes you seem even more great when actually things it go all well turns for you. Around. Yeah. Okay. He's a struggler. He's a battler from birth. So e even though they have to have this noble birth, they then have to have some sort of humble origin to. Yeah, rise he, up from. Yeah, absolutely. He's he's Luke Skywalker. Yeah. Yes. I know. His dad's a baddie. Um, he's cast away and comes back to so lightsaber things to death. I am now going to think of Cyrus as a moisture farmer. <laughs> <laughs> we still we still kind of dig for the underdog, don't we? Yeah. Know, we root for the underdog. It's that kind of thing. Yeah. It's not changed. So there you have it, the birth of Cyrus and what to expect when you served mystery meat by an angry kid. <laughs> I think that there's a, there's a, a lesson, there's a lesson <laughs> there for everyone isn't there, about being careful. If I ever go for a meal with a royal, I'm going vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't trust anything that's offered to you to eat by a stranger. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, James is now booking himself in for psychological therapy. <laughs> Um, thank you for listening. We hope it's been useful and a little entertaining. Leave us a comment below and until next time, goodbye. Bye. Bye.